you know, I figured we'll go ahead and get started because last time we left off on talking about these colleges and some of the crazy stuff happening, and for anyone who, I don't know how you haven't heard about it, but Penn State, MIT, and Harvard were talking in front of Congress, and they were asked directly, does calling for genocide of the Jewish people, is that against your terms when it comes to your college? You know, these colleges that have banned people for, you know, fat phobia, you know, can, is calling for the genocide of Jews, does that go against their co- code of conduct? And their response was, eh, not, <laughs> depends not on exactly. The context. Yeah, <laughs> it depends, depends on, on the context. context. You, and are they actually acting on it or are they just saying it? <laughs> yes, it would well, say um, if it results in actual action and, you know, which the next logical question was, you mean like the actual attempt of genocide? Like, what do you mean by right. that? <laughs> and right. I, I well, don't know. And, and I feel we, know, like... we know you replace, replace the word, you know, Jew with any other marginalized group that the left really supports. And then I, let's see what their thoughts are. I on wish so bad they just asked them, what if some people were chanting trans genocide? What would you say then? Because we know what they would say then. Like, that would definitely not be allowed. But, you know, the good right. part well, is, is, you know, this embarrassing. Even, even, if you just say, even if you just say there's two genders, they say, well, that's you're, you're, you want people genocide have, for trans. People have been removed from Harvard for saying that. Yeah. People have been removed from Harvard for saying that, actually, for two genders. Or at the very least not uh, respecting the pronoun choices, right? Which, what, is, what does that even mean these days when people are calling themselves Z, Zer, Z, Zo, whatever? I mean, it doesn't even matter anymore. It's not even the basic ones at this point. Now it's just made up crap. But, you know, the good part about this is, at least in, you know, it's getting the attention of some of the people who've sent a lot of money to these colleges. And because of that, we are seeing some accountability to a certain extent, kind of, you know, hit or miss. But... Penn State president Liz McGill, who was probably the who did the not probably Penn the worst State. job of the bunch. <laughs> yeah, not Penn State. This is this is Penn, uh, Ivy League Penn. Oh, Ivy League Penn. Okay, well, now I need to get that right. <laughs> yeah, no, she's not. She's not a Nittany Lion. They have their own set of issues. <laughs> well, Liz McGill is, um, you know, had basically stepped down and actually resigned. And the funniest thing about this is now the left is calling for a re-examination of free speech on university campuses. So they had no problem, of course, when Ben Shapiro was kicked off a university campus for giving just a standard speech. They had no problem kicking off um, uh, Gavin McGinnis when he went on to a college. I think he actually went to Penn, actually, and they shut down his speech saying it was going to result in violence, of course. But now when they're saying, oh, they're going to stop us from saying genocide of Jews... Now it's an issue all of a sudden. Now it's actually a problem. <laughs> yeah, it, it's really it, the double standards. You know, we've always known they were there. Uh, it, it's been obvious for a very, very, very long time before even you know the world went crazy like it has here lately. But the, now it's it's not even trying to hide it anymore. You know, the, the old saying the quiet parts out loud. It's. It's just wide open the double standards and this this whole thing of changing language to to support whatever it is that we have to support is the most ridiculous thing I think in the history of the world. <laughs> oh yeah, no, definitely, definitely. But I mean, here's the thing: they, of course, they don't have what's the old saying? If leftists didn't have double standards, they would have no standards, right? <laughs> so I, they don't whatever. really have any. We, actual- we can't. We, we, well, they've got us on this one, so let's just change the language. So now they don't got us on this one. It, <laughs> come on. You know, I, there, there's a couple people I've seen on Twitter basically saying, or I guess, again, X, saying there should be a rule when it comes to whether or not you defend someone's free speech, and that is if they believe in free speech, we defend their free speech. But if they don't believe in free speech, we just don't care and don't defend their right to free speech, right? And I kind of feel like, you know, feel like that at this point where it's like, these are the same people who constantly stop people's ability to speak freely. So why should we care if they get silenced, right? We should well, only be because, really caring about people who actually share our actual values. Well, see, that's the whole thing about free speech. Free speech is designed to protect those who don't share our values and our speech. <laughs> but so, you have to at least share the value of free speech. That's the problem. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> or they'll know, use our own rules against us to a point where they would they will use the system to destroy the system is my thing. It's a tricky thing, but I'm <laughs> I'm still gonna fall on the side of a free speech absolutist, which doesn't again, like we said last week, mean that we support violence, threats, 
any of those kind of things. But which I is what was happening right with these their protests. Well, and the whole thing is, is you know, the violence, you know, well, we can't have a right winger come on, on campus and, and share an opinion that, that these people may not like because they'll be violence. Well, it's your people that's causing the violence. Yes. How about just control the violence and let's let's protect free speech? Well, yeah, and that, that's always been the case, right? It's never the right wing. You don't show me any of the people on the mainstream right whatsoever who have actually gone up to these college campuses and chanted anything remotely similar to what these leftists are chanting about the Jews, right? I there is not a single person on the right you can point to who's done a speech on college campuses where they have called for the actual genocide of people. Now they'll claim, of course, that saying you don't want to respect someone's pronouns is calling for that, which is absolutely ridiculous. But they are actively just literally chanting, you know, Antifada and from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Of course, they don't mean free as in a free country because they don't have freedom and, you know, and those countries in the first place. They mean free of the Jews is what they really mean by that. And that's what Hamas even says the saying means. And they'll go around chanting this all day and night. And that isn't considered at all violence. But if I sit there and say a man is a man and a woman is a woman, oh, you, you're trying to genocide trans people by just having that very basic concept of reality. But the, the scariest part of all of it is a large chunk of one of the major two political parties we have agrees with this, <laughs> with this sentiment uh, that now all of a sudden it's not just that we're going to protect the right to say these things. They actually believe these things. I mean, that's really frightening. Yeah. And, and uh, is Biden going to stand up to his own party and, and, and keep <laughs> focused on protecting Israel and the only democracy really in the Middle East that we can, that we can depend and trust as an ally? And, and I mean, that's that's a whole conversation there about, you know, how we should be looking at Israel in the first place. I mean, my position has always been more, I guess, libertarian on the whole idea of I don't actually like the fact we send them any money. But the reason is, is not because I'm against Israel waging war. It's that actually, I think if we didn't support them in a way where we gave them like the Iron Dome, they would have been forced to conquer almost all the Middle East by this point already. And it would have already been done with, you know, 20 years ago. They wouldn't be dealing with this crap any, you know, right now. You know, as far as I'm concerned, the United States holds the leash of Israel. And what we need to do is just go, all right, fine, we're done with this. Here, you're off the leash. Do your thing. We don't care. Just, you know, leave us out of it. And I, that's kind of my whole thing about it. But here's the funny thing about the right versus the left is that you have people on the right who are all completely for supporting Israel, sending them tons of money, tons of weapons, do whatever it takes. There's people on the right who, of course, would be more than willing to send troops over there to help with their efforts. There's people like me who wants to be completely just not involved with it whatsoever. And we can all discuss this amongst ourselves kind of in the right wing sphere. But the left, there is no discussion with them, right? There is no discussion whatsoever anymore. Well, we're discussing. I'm I'm closer to the I'm closer to the conservative. I hate <laughs> I hate to be closer to the neocons, but I'm a little closer <laughs> to the neocons when it comes to support of Israel. So so you and I don't agree. We don't agree on who our Republican candidate should be. But yet we sit here and are able to talk about these things. But you're right, that would that does not go on on the other side. Now, I, I will admit, if you said you supported Nikki Haley, I'd have a hard time talking with you about it. But, um, <laughs> you well, know, I got to keep hitting Nikki Haley every episode. <laughs> uh, you do. I, I, I think you're a misogynist, but uh, that's another <laughs> whole story. Um, I've, I, I've got no real qualms with her. I, I, she's not my choice, but uh, I, I don't feel so passionately against her like you do. I, listen, so, I, 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 enjoy maybe, watching, I, I enjoy watching the hair stand up on the back of your neck when you get all upset about it. <laughs> The hair stamp on the back of my neck. What, what hair are you talking about? <laughs> I don't know. Let, it might be a quick segue, but let me just say, um, did you see Nikki Haley bringing her daughter to an interview to complain about Vivek attacking her daughter, who's 25 years old and married, so it's not like he's actually bringing a kid into it or anything like Nikki Haley was saying? Like She brings her daughter up there saying, Vivek brought this young kid into this debate, and it's so terrible to bring kids into these kind of discussions like this. And she's bringing her kid to the interview to talk. And not only that, but her kid's like 25 years old and married. Like at that point, I'm sorry. Like you're an adult. You can deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did think that was kind of rich. So <laughs> especially after the whole, uh, she pulled the whole Will Smith, get your, get my daughter's name out of your mouth. <laughs> now everyone, look at my daughter. It's a great yeah. selling point for me. <laughs> yeah. But you know, back, back to the colleges, you know, right here, um, 
you know, they said universities have a dual obligation to both uphold the free speech rights of their students and talk about political issues like Israel, Palestine, and to learn in an environment that is, uh, bleh, I can't speak all of a sudden, that is free from true threats or other forms of unprotected misconduct. Since when did they have they cared about free speech, right? So back in the 70s, they were curbing free speech when it came to the right. I mean, really, as far back as the 70s, you can actually start seeing some issues where they would start using the heckler's veto, right? Where they would get rioters out there to just shut it down. Maybe not on the college side, but at least get to a point where the event just simply can't happen, right? Where the college, of course, couldn't provide the security. And we saw that happen all the way up, literally all the way up through the last election, up till now where they literally banned or really kicked people out of college for, again, simple opinions. Yet all of a sudden now, of course, they're going to go around and say, um, well, we need to re we need to really look at free speech these days. And, and well, well, it's not, it's not even, I mean, it's, it went so far as to deny applications based on tweets from people that they tweeted when yes. they were 12 or 13 years old. And, and in fact, like there that. was a, there was a high school in California that literally got called on camera telling their students if you sit there and do not put your pronouns in your application papers, you will not be accepted into these colleges. All right, that is how far they've gone. Where they're now basically mandating without mandating that you actually put your preferred pronouns in your papers. And it's funny, if you go online and look up like how to write a resume, a lot of those um, instructions will tell you stuff like, oh, you have to put your pronouns on there as well. So they're pushing this stuff wherever they can. And the schools openly admit at this point, basically, that if you don't do this, the colleges will discriminate against you because of your viewpoints. Well, it, it, I know which way they're going to lean on a college application, whether you put them or not. In the business world, good luck putting them on there because there's a lot of people that are going to say the pronouns and say, nope, that's going to be too much trouble down the road. I don't want to well, put up with, with this. I mean, that's why they're trying to push for protections for that sort of stuff in different states. Now, how can you actually prove that? obviously is a problem but frankly why can't a business owner simply just say up front that no i think this person's a wacko i don't want them in my business i mean i don't see why that should be even an issue but you know places like new york california and colorado and some of these other states there's already laws on the book saying that if you discriminate based on their preferred pronouns or the fact they want to have a preferred pronoun you're the one who will be sued so i mean they're already trying to curve that the best they can at a lot of these larger you know, more heavily blue states. So, you know, you know, when we're working with business owners, we focus heavily on know your values, know the culture you want to create, hire to your values. Uh, you better, you better have a good core of what you want your community, what you want your business to be all about, and then stick to that hire, hire for attitude and, and, and value alignment. And then you can train the rest most of the time. You have to have a certain level of aptitude, but um, but as long as it's the right attitude and it's a, and it's a good fit for the culture you're creating, it, it, it's it's going to be better for you. So just be careful. <laughs> well, it, it's kind of funny because um, I once thought it was a Ziegler quote. You know, your out your uh, attitude takes your altitude or whatever. I mean, at the end mm -hmm. of the day, it really is more about that than anything else. And it's one of those things where I've seen. You know, while I worked with non in the nonprofit stuff, one of the things they told us was if you have a bunch of volunteers, if you get like 20 percent of them becoming like extremely negative, you about have to get rid of everyone because, you know, that negativity and just kind of that mindset and the problems that can cause are pretty much like cancer. Right. It just it spreads throughout the rest of the people pretty quickly. And so they were actually telling us, you know, if you get like a bad situation where 20 percent of the people are really problematic in a way, you about need to get rid of all of them because of that. Because it has already probably infested the others as well. You just haven't seen it manifest just yet. Yeah, so you have to be quick. You have to be quick to pull the trigger when you see when you see the problems coming up and, and protect your culture at all costs. But leading leading in a volunteer organization is a great proving ground for leadership because you're leading from a no leverage position. So <laughs> if you can learn to lead in that setting, uh, it, it's it actually again it's a good proving ground. You'll you'll come out much stronger as a leader. Well, you know, it's funny, you mentioned, you know, knowing your values and, you know, obviously, you know, Penn uh, president, you know, they they, res or they resigned. But clearly the values of Harvard are totally different considering the fact of <laughs> she, Claude, or was it Claudine Gay, is still actually the president over there, even though now Harvard has lost over $1 billion in donations 
because of her basically saying the same as that thing, right? That it's okay to call for genocide of the Jews so long as, you know, it's within context. <laughs> so, I uh, do you know who um, uh, Bill Ackman is? Bill Ackman. I, I don't know that I do, or maybe I'm just misremembering. So he's a multi-billionaire who apparently is like really big on Wall Street, and this is kind of me just Googling it pretty quickly. I've heard his name tossed around before, but he has basically decided that he's not going to hire anyone coming out of Harvard, MIT, until the presidents have resigned. That is what you know his role is, and so they're already seeing pushback. Him as well as a few other um, you know people who normally have some Jewish connections, obviously, because they're the ones who are going to be primarily offended by this, have said they are not going to hire anyone coming out of these colleges until the presidents are held accountable. But the funny thing is, of course, that Claudine Gay has, despite losing over a billion dollars, despite the fact that people graduating out of her college will not have as many opportunities because of her actions, she is still here. And it's really funny because when you really look at her, when people really started kind of diving more into how she got her position, it's clear that she has no business being president of or being the principal of a high school, let alone being president of Harvard. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> we can have a plagiarist as the president of the United States, but not a <laughs> plagiarist as the president of Harvard? Is that what you're telling me? I know, right? I mean, uh, uh, you know, at least if one thing, Democrats are consistent, right? You know, plagiarism, you know, okay, pres- <laughs> if it's, it's if it's okay for the president, it's okay for her, right? But it, it's I'm, funny, old, you, I'm old enough. I'm old enough to remember the current president of the United States dropping out of the election of 1988. This happened in 1987. <laughs> After 11 or 14 days, let's just call it two weeks of really pressure with the legacy media actually doing journalism and reporting the facts of Biden's lies and his plagiarism. He was forced to drop out of the presidential race. And yet here he is. <laughs> So why don't we just redefine Because this is another word we're going to redefine, apparently. They're going to redefine how many lines you can copy and it not be called plagiarism <laughs> to protect, I guess, Democrats, because that's the ones who are getting away with it. 